want to say good morning to everybody and uh, say how Psalm 40 has so surprised me in the last day. Um, the first two of the three Psalms are often get a chance to prepare over the weekend, but the last one in this case was yesterday afternoon and evening. And as I continue to explore Psalm 40, I am left again startled by its richness and its surprises that I will uh, look to share uh, with you. Psalm 40 is distinctly of two parts. And the first part, which is verses 1 to 13, focus on expressing gratitude to God. And then verses 14 to 18 is almost verbatim, though with a few word changes, Psalm 70, which we will, I'll have less to prepare because that's the entirety of Psalm 70 uh, when we get there. And yet this is a Psalm, Psalm 40, with some distinctive ideas that I hope to come back to. Ideas we've touched on and then some novel things. So the image of Shir Chadash, a new song that I wish to sing, that's embedded here. The expression Ha'ach, Ha'ach, which I translate as Ha'ha, Ha'ha, that kind of exclamation um, appears here as well. But there's some new things here. And the new things are a sense of Torah from within. That's one element, and that'll be at the middle. You know, I've grown more recently to look at what's the bullseye, what's at the center of the psalm, and that's verses eight and nine. And not unlike yesterday where I had many translations, so I will share some translations, varying translations of verses eight and nine. But let me just read mine to get a sense of what is, in fact, distinctive to this psalm. Then I said, Behold, I come with the scroll of a book that is written upon me. To do your will, my God, I desire, and your Torah is in my innermost parts. I'll also look to return to this image that does exist in Jeremiah and Ezekiel of the Torah written from within the person. But that's at the center, which leads me to, before I read the psalm, to have three possible readings in terms of an overview. Rashi, you know, the medieval commentator, France, 11th century, and Broyles, a modern commentator, both see this entire psalm as a public declaration. So the psalmist is speaking, and you'll see in verse 4, in verse 6, about our God. God has done wonders for us, and sees this as faithful are you and I, and a witnessing, public witnessing. Benjamin Siegel, in contrast, says, we can talk in the we, but because this is personal, this is in fact a statement of an individual making reference to community, placing himself within the community. Martin Cohen, who has a creative translation and commentary to the Psalms, uh, colleague now in Long Island, formerly a Temple lot in Mission Viejo. Martin Cohen, who's prolific in his writing, he sees this as telling a story. Here's the story he hears being told. He sees it as parallel to Jeremiah. It's the person who had an awakening. The Torah's awakening to him, this revelation was, which is another key element of this psalm. It is not speaking on behalf of God. 
It is not your sacrifices that I seek, but your trustworthiness, your fulfillment of goodness in the world. And here's how Martin Cohen plays out as he sees this psalm. Not unlike Jeremiah, this person preached that inner Torah and got put in a pit, put in jail for it, and was released from jail. And you'll see toward the beginning the imagery of having been um, raised up from a pit from slimy clay in verse 3. And so now he's been redeemed. That's the first half of the psalm. And he, again, his... his um, source of suffering was proclaiming to the community this vital teaching that all the service in the temple, that's secondary. What God really wants is righteousness. And now he's free, but he still has enemies. And he's afraid that the enemies are going to put him back in jail because he still has the need to proclaim his truth. And he's not sure if the enemies will put him back in the pit and he's not sure if God will yet again free him because he sees the deliverance formally from God, but he has the need to preach. So three different possibilities, meaning a positive singing within community, a vital song, a personal statement to God about two parts of his life being in difficulty and delivered and still having difficulties, or it being part of one story of why he had difficulties and now yearns for the <clears throat> God's saving grace, but still continues to look for trouble. All right, let me read it to you. Let me put it up on the screen. This, again, is a psalm. not unlike yesterday, with a variety of possible translations. And I'm particularly going to focus today on verses 8 and 9. Here's something else that is not part of the Hebrew, and that's quotation marks. So I've mentioned how pronouns are not capitalized, leading to varieties of interpretation. Likewise, quotation marks, as we'll see, is an unknown and leads to different understanding. I've changed the title many times. Immediately before this, I called it Faithful Are You and Am I? But coming to what's distinctive about this psalm, verses 8 and 9, I've renamed it, Testifying to Torah from Within. For the conductor, the Psalm of David. I surely hoped for Adonai, and God inclined toward me and heard my cry for deliverance. God raised me up from the miry pit and out of the slimy clay and set my feet upon a rock, steadying my steps, and put into my mouth a new song, a hymn to our God. Many will see and feel awe and trust in Adonai. Ashrei, happy is the person that placed Adonai as the source of trust and has not turned to the arrogant nor purveyors of falsehood. Many things have you done, you, Adonai, my God. Your wonders and your thoughts are for us. None can compare to you. I would declare and speak of them, but they are more than can be told. Animal sacrifice and meal offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened, holy burnt offering and sin offering you have not requested. Then I said, quote, behold, I come with the scroll of a book that is written upon me. To do your will, my God, I desire, and your Torah is in my innermost parts, unquote. I have proclaimed righteousness in a large congregation. Behold, my lips I did not seal. Adonai, you know. Your righteousness I did not hide within my heart. Your faithfulness and your deliverance I have declared. I did not conceal your kindness and your faithfulness from the large congregation. 
You, Adonai, did not seal off your compassion from me. Let your kindness and your truthfulness always protecting me. For enveloping me are evils too many to count. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I cannot see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has abandoned me. Be pleased, Adonai, to save me. Adonai, to my help hasten. Let them be ashamed and humiliated together, those who seek to sweep away my spirit. Let them fall back and be disgraced, those who desire my heart. Let them be appalled on account of their shame, those who say to me, ha, ha. Let them exult and rejoice in you, all those who seek you. Let them always say, Adonai be magnified, those who are eager for your deliverance. But as for me, poor and needy, let my superior account for me, my help who frees me, you are, my God, do not delay. So a few stylistic things to note and then to get more into the content. One of the things that is not uncommon in Psalms, but is particularly evident here, is the power of repeated words. There are fully 20 repeated roots, which means at least 40 words are of a repetition. So that's part of the trajectory, the forward motion and the rhythm of this psalm. Something else that is more here than in other psalms, and that's the emphasis on body parts. So on that sense, this is a very physical psalm. Verse three, my feet, my steps. Verse four, my mouth. Verse seven, my ears. Verse nine, my intestines, or my innermost part. Verse 10, my lips. 11, my heart. Verse 13, the hair on my head and my heart and 15, my life itself. So there is a lot here of physicality in the weave of the psalm. And so with that, and always aware of the limitation of time, I want to point out, again, some of the key thematic themes. Verse 7 is not an uncommon teaching within our prophets. Animal sacrifice and meal offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Whole, which means he learned, that's again going to link to verse 8. Meaning, my ears you have opened. You've revealed this to me somehow. I've been attentive to your message. Holy burnt offerings, Ola and Chatat, sin offerings, you have not requested. You get that image in Isaiah, it's the Haftorah of Yom Kippur, where God says through the prophet, it is not your fast that I seek, it is not your physical offerings that I seek, but that you are righteous and holy. And so that is a key teaching here in verse 7 that leads, I mean, with that phrase, Oznayim karita li, my ears you have opened, to saying that he, the Psalter, had this revelation. And now verse 8, then I said, Behold, I come with the scroll of a book that is written upon me. The Megillat Sefer Katuv Alai. And here, a little bit on those quotation marks that I mentioned in the introduction. Look how differently it can be understood. Art scroll, the orthodox compendium, which I use again to find the medieval um, commentators presented, has the only thing in quotation marks, behold, I have come. <laughs> so I said to God, here I am. And then the rest is what is the description of being present before God, the scroll of a book that is written upon me to do your will. So the only thing in quotation marks is verse eight. Other people, um, 
Another example is JPS. Um, here, he puts verse eight in quotation marks, Jewish Publications Society, but not verse nine. But listen to this translation of verse eight. Then I said, quote, see, I will bring a scroll recounting what befell me. Now that is, you know, I'm going to tell you, God, about, you know, this history. For classical commentators, the reference here in verse 8, like Rashi, France, 11th century, Ibn Ezra, Spain, 12th century. This is referring, verse 8, this scroll to the scroll of Torah and Mount Sinai and is written or expressed as, I have come with the scroll of a book that is written for me, not upon me in that sense, but written for me, meaning I come with your teaching, God. Very different, of course, understanding. Here's something else even, verse 9. Um, others will put verse 9, will continue to have verse 9 in quotation marks. Um, that's true for the Mitsuda, which is, again, an Orthodox translation as well. It's the way I chose to do it. And when it says, to do you will, my God, I desire, and your Torah is in my innermost parts, Rashi will say, this is referring to the rules of what we eat. So your Torah is even regulating my dietary laws, that the Torah has rules of kashrut, much more concrete than that description of Martin Cohen, which is the prophet like Jeremiah, who just has to speak from within his most core sense of conscience. I, I'm reminded with that Rashi, so a little aside, I had a cousin who was trained at Ner Yisrael Yeshiva in Baltimore, which is the most um, admired misnagid yeshiva. Misnagid is not Hasidic. It's the Lithuanian orientation of more Talmudic, a, a large, the, maybe the oldest ongoing yeshiva of significance in America. He was a cousin who had 15 children from one wife. He was, uh, spent his life, he just died within the last six months in his uh, late 80s. He spent it teaching ethics in a yeshiva of the famous Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. But the free association is he once took his children to an aquarium on like a holiday outing. But as a man deeply immersed in the study of sacred text and living a pious Jewish life, they went tank to tank to discern which fish were kosher. So that became the outing's focus. Uh, and I smiled and when I learned that in terms of, you know, you get a lens and the lenses we each wear uh, provide very different experiences and different readings of life and different readings of a text. And so for the classic commentators, verse eight and nine at the center of this is a proclamation of faithfulness on behalf of the community to Torah and its precepts. And this entire psalm is to be read as a ode to faithfulness, both on the part of God and on the part of us knowing our responsibilities that come out of Torah. And so eight and nine at the center can be read very differently. I, I do want to just share two readings because I see this as something important, this notion of Torah inscribed within the heart. And we have that image in Jeremiah. 
chapter 31, verse 33. But such is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. Again, speaking of a messianic time. I will put my teaching into their inmost being, Torah ti bikir bam, same roots here, and inscribe it upon their hearts. And likewise, Jeremiah will say in the beginning of chapter 17, in a, in a very different way, this is not the positive Torah, but another image of the inscriptions of, on, upon the heart. The guilt, the guilt of Judah, verse 1, is inscribed with a stylus of iron, engraved with an adamant point on the tablet of their hearts and on the horns of their altars while their children remember. So that the image, which also will occur in Ezekiel and elsewhere, Ezekiel has this image actually in chapter 3, of being given a scroll to eat. <laughs> that kind of combines the eight and nine. Um, so the idea of internalizing Torah and speaking as if one is Torah oneself. You know, this will play out later. And I'm again continuing just to stay focused on this image of Torah from within, but even in another way. As Martin Cohen describes this moment, this individual sees himself as having become Torah. I come with the scroll of a book that is written upon me, is to say, I am Torah. I proclaim to the people that truth that I learned that they want your righteousness and not your offerings to give you. So that I am not only speaking of the Torah from within me, I am Torah. And here's a beautiful image that my teacher, Rabbi David Hartman, shared with me so many decades ago. And that is on the holiday of which we celebrate the completion of the reading of Torah, that being Simcha Torah, in a yeshiva, in a place of religious study, there would be the dancing in a static way with the scrolls. But at a certain point, so Rabbi Hartman said, a teacher would be elevated and be danced with to say that this teacher embodies Torah in his Torah too for us. And even as I share it, I get the goosebumps of that image of the joy and the honoring of an individual who embodies Torah and becomes Torah for his students or her students as the image that is shared here of Torah being written on the person. And in verse 9, the Torah emerges or is in my innermost parts. So what I didn't address is these last verses. I'll just say a little bit about verses 14 to 18, but I'll back up. Let me, let me repost for a moment. I just wanted to see everybody. Let me just do this little description. So all that proclamation, eight and nine, again, is at the center of this psalm. If the psalm is a whole, and even if it's not a whole, it comes close to it. And then you got verse 14, which is again later 70. Transition, verse 12, God, you're truthful. Verse 13, but I got troubles. And 14, I got a request. 15 and 16, I have enemies. And they're, interestingly, in this case, the Psalter does not ask that this enemies be destroyed, which we have seen. He just says, you know, Put a check on them. Let them be embarrassed by their falsehoods. And this expression, ha, ha, or ha, ah, ha, ah, I did some research on it in the concordance because I just find it fascinating. 
you recall we saw it three times in verse 35 in Psalm 35. That will be verse 4 of Psalm 70, verse 16. And here, those are the three times it appears in Psalms. And in fact, it only occurs 12 times in all of Tanakh, Hebrew scripture, this word ha'ach, and seven of those times are in these three expressions, plus the one, in these three psalms. It will also occur in Isaiah in reference to an idolater warming himself, gleefully proclaiming ha'ach. In Ezekiel, it will occur three times, usually in reference to enemies. Each case, they are enemies proclaiming their victory over Israel, and then they will be punished. And once in the book of Job, it's God speaking in his closing oration of the mystery of creation, in which a horse getting ready to do battle is fearless, and the horse proclaims, Ha'ach. So, I'm again just fascinated by this omnipotent po poetic um, word in Hebrew, ha'ach, that we see in verse 16. Verse 17 is about the righteous. Now it's moving toward a close and a prayer. Let the righteous exult and rejoice, they who proclaim Adonai be magnified which has a resonance, by the way, for me, of the Kaddish, Yit Gadal the Yit Kaddash, Yit Gadal Adonai. And yet, the last verse, but as for me, va'ani, ani ve'vyon Adonai, poor and needy, let my superior account for me, my help who frees me, you are my God, do not delay. So there's a sense of urgency al ta'achar, and that's how it ends. It ends not like many psalms, pulling it together, but with a sense of impending danger. Do not delay, come to my help. And his self-description of being poor and needy, ani ve'evyon, that too is left to commentary. Is he poor and needy as a outcast and physically that gives context for him proclaiming the hypocrisy of those who would bring their wealthy gifts to God? Or is he poor and needy as a statement of humility? That, you know, I am not so presumptuous to declare myself as righteous. Um, I am poor and needy. I am ani in, the, in that sense. It could be either way, of course. And to pull this together, each of the Psalms is remarkable. The more I've delved into them, I continue to untie little packets, packages, and, be, and marvel over the emotional potency of what's being shared finding in each psalm a little nuanced, different focus. In this case, it's the focus of the Torah written within me and proclaiming this teaching to the community that it is not your sacrifices that God wants, but rather your righteousness. And the Psalter, is he speaking to the community at large? Is this a private conversation? That too is unknown. And the context, is it in the abstract that he's teaching this? Or is that the description at the beginning of the psalm of why he was in a pit and now is freed? And so I welcome your reactions. For faithful are you and am I, or as I finally chose to call it, testifying to Torah from within. Rabbi, yeah. I wanted to uh, put something in there. I, when I heard you talking about the Torah being written upon him, it almost reminded me of when we wrapped the fila 
because we're supposed to wrap it tight enough that when you remove the straps that it leaves Hebrew letter on you. And that that's what I was reminded of. So I'm going to uh, add to Eric's um, association, and that is in the morning when we traditionally pray when it's not the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is the sign of God, and otherwise, on a weekday, the sign of God is our wrapping of leather. And when we're done, we do a shin on our hand, which is the first letter of God's name, one of God's names, Shaddai. And we wrap our finger in the Dalad and then uh, the Yud at the back. So we're spelling out our commitment to God. And literally when I'm done praying to build on Eric's point, I have seven marks on my forearm for the seven wraps that represent either the seven days of creation or the three patriarchs and four matriarchs or both. God relating to us as both creator and communal guide. And so we literally mark ourselves with Torah. Um, that's uh, a nice image to share. Other things that this psalm prompted for you? I, uh, I, mean, I just wanted to say something about the grammar of the final sentence. Yes, Hal. Uh, you have um, the subject uh, comes following um, after the verb, and then it's juxtaposed next to my God. You are my God, but you should be the first uh, word in that uh, line, but he, it's saved in your translation to be absolutely next to my God. That's all. Are you following what I'm saying there? I, I'm not sure that I am. So, it begins in Hebrew. The first word in Hebrew is va'ani. Ani uh, is I. So some people translate it and I, um, poor and needy. Or it can be translated as but as for me. And interestingly, in this case, the word used for God is Adonai, spelled out, which means my master and as I've shared in a previous class, I've grown to translate as my superior, which fits with, um, you know, the humility of being poor and needy before God. And what is a recurring theme that Hal is giving me an opportunity to focus in on, in verse 18, it will then say, who helps, who frees me, and then the word you. And you'll have a number of times that the word you is used. So, Ata, you, Elohai, are my God, Al Ta'acher, don't delay. And by the way, the word Al without punctuation can also be El, God, or God delays. <laughs> so, you could almost have a wordplay there in terms of what is the punctuation and the meaning of the last word. With that said, Hal, what would come back, Hal, and see if I've clarified about the grammar um, or if there's another piece you want to focus on? Oh, just the last line. Yeah, so the last line is Ezra T, you are my help, U Mithalti Ata, you who frees me, or frees me are you. Um, Elohai, my God, Alta Achar, do not delay. Um, other uh, reactions? I don't know. I can't always see. We have more than. We Mimi have Mimi. has her hand up. Go ahead, Mimi. Um, when I when I was reading, same same verse, the the eighteenth verse. Yes. Um, and. Um, and, and the idea that um, that the Psalter is saying, don't delay, you know, yes. I, I need you now. Yes. Um, so I looked at the last verse um, from yesterday of um, uh, Psalm 39, look away from me that I might catch my breath before I go forth and am no more. So when we talked yesterday, that was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. Yeah. And... And then in the, in um, in today's psalm, um, 
it's, you know, don't delay. I have more to do. I'm, I'm not dying. That's lovely. And 39 and 40, actually 38, 39, 40, and 41 are often grouped as a series. So for instance, today's Psalm, remember 38 and 39 were so dark. Yeah. The psalmist was in despair because of feeling in 38 isolated in, in 39 um, deeply threatened. And this is seen as the next moment in David's life. Classically, here he's celebrating his liberation from those earlier threats uh, conveyed in Psalm 38 and 39. And yet he's still the king and he's still in turmoil uh, with those who surround them. And in that regard, I shared that the Torah scroll for Rashi and Ibn Ezra that was mentioned in verse eight and nine is the Torah scroll of Mount Sinai. But another commentator, classic commentator, Sforno from Italy, he says that this is King David continuing to speak and the Torah scroll of eight and nine is what the Talmud in Sanhedrin 21b requires of a king to write his own Torah scroll and to always carry it with him to remember his responsibilities before God. Mm. So that back to you linking Psalm 39 and 40, for Sporno and for the classic commentators, this is still King David. And here the Torah is God's Torah and his responsibilities as a king. Um, Ahuva, do you have anything to add today? Because I didn't get a chance yesterday, no? So I'm going to pull this together for today and say that next week we're going to meet twice. With, ver with Psalm 41, we will finish what's called the first book of Psalms. And then I think it's 42 to 72. It's a smaller book for book two. And we'll celebrate. I don't know what we'll do to celebrate. Maybe we'll all bring a cup of something we enjoy drinking, cup of coffee or hot chocolate. We'll toast the completion, have a little see you. Richard's already anticipating that moment. We'll celebrate the completion of a book of Torah, the first book of the five books of Psalms. And we'll do then, as is our tradition, we continue on immediately. We'll do Psalm 42 on Wednesday. Wednesday night is Tisha B'Av and is Thursday, so we will not meet on Thursday next week, just Tuesday and Wednesday, but we will celebrate on Tuesday. Richard, did you, your, your square lit up? I, 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 I no, I, uh, uh, I don't have anything unless, yes, unless it's just a comment, and I think you finished with the comments, so oh, all right. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, though. You're, you're welcome. So we finish um, today with the, um, one moment, with, um, one second. I just want to put up the Mourner's Kaddish. We're getting <coughs> more adept at this. You can put it up, Rabbi, if you want. Um, let me see here. I got it. All right. Um, for those saying Kaddish, um, I invite you to join together. Yitkadal. Yitkadash. Shemay Rabba. Amen. Amen. Alma Divra Kirute. Malkute. Bahayahome, <laughs> Vita dark, Vita Vita 
Each for joining a special guest conversation um, this coming Tuesday at 7.30, I will be in public conversation with Professor Elliot Dorf, the key ethicist within the, um, I think it's fair to say, in the non-Orthodox Jewish community of America, who teaches at American Jewish University. And he will be talking about the ethical issues. He's on the Committee of Ethics at UCLA Medical Center. He'll talk about, he's the chair of the um, rabbinical Conference of Law and Standards, and he'll talk about some of the halachic issues that have come up around COVID, like synagogue and Shabbat. And he's also a past president of the Jewish Family Service and a deep, deep person, um, kind of doing a little rabbinic pastoral sharing in terms of the challenges for individuals and families during this time. So Tuesday at 7.30 to put on your calendar. Great to see you all. Thank you. I want yes, to you. Thank you. You're all welcome. Bye-bye, everybody. Be well.